When you're talking to an LLM, a large language model, you're effectively talking to yourself in the mirror. It's a very eager intern. Because you could totally see the intern being like, can I get you anything? Can I get you some coffee? You don't want a yes man, you want a collaborator. I'm not gonna come up with a better analogy than eager intern. I know a lot of people here already know who you are, but some people on the following might not just yet. Can you just introduce yourself and your job at Microsoft. Yeah, sure. My name is Scott Hanselman. I'm a VP at Microsoft and developer community. Uh, I've worked at Microsoft for about 15 years. Uh, I've worked in software for about 32 years. I taught at Oregon Institute of Technology and I taught at Portland Community College. Now I'm guess I'm, I guess I'm doing developer advocacy. Developer advocacy, influencer, it's all BS. You're either teaching people how to improve themselves and like, or you're not. So Scott, how has Ignite been for you? Uh, it's pretty cool. This has been big. This is like thousands and thousands of people. Mostly I go to community conferences that are less than a thousand. This thing is like, I don't know, there's like 10,000 people here. It's crazy. We had a seminar yesterday and we talked a lot about get a whole pilot and the ways you can use it as almost like a second eye. Yeah, it's like a partner or a pair programmer or a friend. It makes me think about like how many times have you had an assignment that you want to do? It's two o'clock in the morning, the night that it's due. There's two ways to use Copilot. There's the wrong way, which is just have it write the thing for you. That's not really, that's kind of cheating. But if you can back and forth, if you can vibe with it, if you can have a conversation like, hey, I'm thinking about using a hash table here, but maybe I should use a dictionary. Like, what do you think? You can have those conversations. It's two in the morning. Who else would you have that conversation with? When you're alone and it's just you, you want to do what's called rubber ducking. Have you heard of rubber yes. ducking? Yeah, you put a rubber duck on the top of your monitor and you talk to the rubber duck. So I rubber duck with uh, GitHub Copilot. They talked about in the demo was the fact that like when you're first starting out with coding and your first job that like you have a hard time wanting someone else to look at your code because you're afraid of what their opinion is or you're afraid that you formatted it wrong and you didn't read the correct doc. Exactly. Yeah, like the fear of judgment. So I like the way you're phrasing that, this idea that like, I don't want to show anyone this yet, it's not ready. But Copilot is not going to judge you. It's not going to tattle on you. So it's like, hey, would you give a first pass, a first code pass? With this introduction of AI to this point where like, it almost feels like sometimes people rely on it, you had another seminar today all about responsible use of AI. So how does that, how do you feel with like the younger generations getting introduced to AI in this way? I personally think that the number one first thing you should all learn about when you learn AI, no matter what, what age you are, is that it's possibly going to generate bullshit. It's like being street smart. You Google for stuff. Do you trust everything on Google? No, you have a BS detector. And you're like, nah, that doesn't feel right. And how do you do that? Well, you do that based on your trust relationship with the domain. If you see a piece of news, you click on the domain, you feel some kind of way about that news company. Someone told me cinnamon cures my diabetes. Is this on the New York Times or is this on some dude's blog? With AI, you don't see that. So that's why all of the different things that we're doing with Copilot with GitHub Copilot and with you know M365 Copilot is that if it thinks something, give me a reference. Tell me the link that made you think that, and then I will visit that link and confirm it. So like trust but verify everything because you don't know what it's thinking. It doesn't make it bad. This isn't saying all AIs are dumb. It's just saying it's not smarter than you. So you need to be the one who is gonna check the work. During this entire event was um, the art of prompting and being able to make sure that when you're prompting the chats and everything, that like you're doing it in a format that is making sure you're not just leading it on to whatever answer you actually want. Yeah, that's, that's a great example because you can lead it all the way up to a point where it could lie back to you. You, you can gaslight yourself because when you're talking to an LLM, a large language model, you're effectively talking to yourself in the mirror. And if you start saying, you know, well, I think that probably hash tables are the right thing to do. It'll be like, oh yeah, hash tables, 100%, yeah. But if you said, well, no, maybe a dictionary. Oh yeah, dictionaries, yeah, yeah. It, it's a very eager intern. <laughs> I can see exactly why you say it too. Because you could totally see the intern being like, can I get you anything? Can I get you some coffee? <laughs> yeah, can I, can I make that hash table for you in C-sharp? You don't want a yes man or a yes person. You want a collaborator. The other problem is that we think it's human. We think it's a brain. It is not. It is a random number generator attached to words. And it just it's not going to reliably tell you what you want. So you need to give it good data. So like if you're using M365 Copilot, I can go in there and say, hey, I have a meeting with DB. Can I prepare? And it'll give me ideas on how to prepare. 
that is super cool. And if, if it gets something wrong, that's still an incredibly valuable thing. But if I'm saying do my homework for me, that hurts everybody. Have you had people coming up to you and just being like, I want this or this or this, and you just been like, that's not what AI does? My opinion is AI is not for creativity. AI is for augmentation. I don't want AI to make art. I want to make art. If it can help me make art better, that's fine. But if I go and say, make me a famous artist, that's like you know, rubbing a genie and saying, make me a famous artist. There's no work involved. So I think the challenge is that the promise of AI is that I don't have to work anymore. I just believe that AI should make the tedious parts of your job easier. I like using it for punctuation checking. Like yeah. Most of the time it's spelling, punctuation. Sometimes it's like formatting. Where I'm like, did I Love actually it. Grammarly all article? the way, right? Like, Grammarly and I are best friends. <laughs> it's a victimless crime. I actually saw a, a thing on my Microsoft Outlook where it said, do you need help with your tone? Because I was, it could tell I was about to like regret hitting that. Like I would like an AI to tell me I'm about to send in a, forget the attachment. You know, like that kind of uh, stuff. All the little tedious things. But I don't want one to go and write me an entire book. It just does, it feels like it takes out the humanity aspects of creativity, which I think where you give it like the art and the things like that. Someone took time to create something by hand. And I think there's so much value to that still. So then the question is, is AI going to cause a deluge of garbage art and garbage blogs and garbage, you know, tech channels that are just generated? Or is it going to cause us to all appreciate bespoke craftsman, craftsperson stuff. You get on to the second one, honestly, because you get, we, we already have a thing for it. We call it AI art. We don't call it art. It, it got its own category there so you go. quickly. Keep it in its own category. My followers are all young. What is the biggest thing you want to tell them when it comes to AI, when it comes okay. to using GitHub specifically? I yeah. just would love to learn that part. Well, so back to the comment about like the generation gap. I'm not just somebody saying work harder and everything will be great. I am saying, and this is an analogy I think I used with you before, is learn to drive stick shift in whatever you're doing so you can just go, all right, I understand what stick shift is. You drive? Yep. You drive stick? Terribly, but yes. Okay, but you can drive stick. That like already puts you in the top 2% of drivers because how many of your friends drive stick? Probably not a lot. Exactly. So by driving stick, you know more about the car. You understand your relationship to the car. That doesn't mean you don't love an Uber, right? But if you're a person that only Ubers, then you have no driving ability. And if you're a person who only drives automatic, you have no stick shift to do for the, now, when you code, do you code in, in JavaScript usually? Lately, it's been a lot of Python. Okay, so you're writing a lot of Python. Do you ever do anything in C? Kind of it, but not by much. Would you think of C as like driving stick, right? And then assembly language would be even lower. So find the place that is your, uh, your comfort zone and get uncomfortable. So if you do Python, learn a little C. And that doesn't mean you need to become an expert in C. You just need to get uncomfortable and go, yeah, okay. I know why I love Python. I understand how to drive stick in an emergency. If you appreciate what's underneath, like, like we talked about the difference between a JPEG and a PNG, that stuff matters. The AI is not gonna save you from not understanding how to change your tire, how to change your oil, and how to drive stick when you need to. So I would encourage everyone who's a developer or a coder or a beginner, try to learn the basics. The basics, the basics matter. What you think the AI is doing is making it so you don't need to know the basics. The base of the pyramid matters the most of all right now.